Welcome to the Intercultural Dialogue, Understanding Wenzhou from a Global Perspective lecture series. This is talk number five, entitled Molecular Logics and Traditional Wenzhou Materials for Contemporary Sculpture. My name is Spencer Steenbluck. I teach for Wenzhou Kane University here in Wenzhou, and I'm happy to be here collaborating with the Wenzhou Museum to put together these talks. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about about sculpture and how I was inspired by Wenzhou to make these sculptures specifically. Here you can see a quintessential example of Chinese painting. It's made on these, these scrolls and there are many of them to create uh, a multi-piece multi uh, uh, composition. This, this painting is um, a masterpiece and is quintessential of Chinese painting from the past. One of the thing that's, things that's most noticeable about it is that the, that the paper and the way that the paper is made has an intrinsic quality that's implied upon, upon the composition. The composition is made of many pieces of paper because of the way that the paper is made. The paper is only able to be made uh, with this width. And so in order to accommodate a large piece of, a large image, they use many pieces of paper to accomplish that. And that goes into how the paper is made. The paper is made uh, in a certain way, and then that influences the piece of art that's, that comes out of it. Now, this paper is most likely um, Wenzhou born paper. And they've been exporting paper from Wenzhou as early as the Tang Dynasty. And inside the, the Qing Dynasty, they were using it as tribute for the emperor. <clears throat> the Wenzhou Museum has some wonderful examples of, of uh, scripts and paintings that were most likely done using this Jing paper. And the Jing paper uh, was was uh, known for its beautiful whiteness and purity. It was very clean paper, and so everyone wanted to use it. And it was so, so popular that they didn't tax the, the, the paper makers, which is amazing. Um, here we can see another example of, of a script that's written using, using this, this parchment of this paper coming from Wenzhou. One of the things that's most amazing about, uh, when, about the paper and how it, how it uh, affects the art is that, that the process that, that, is, that happens within... The Zhuan paper was used for, for pieces like this because of its, its purity and its, its whiteness. And uh, these pieces of paper were, were made by a certain process, and that process limited its, its, qual its quantity, its, qu its quality, and its size. And so then artists, poets, statesmen used this paper because of, because of its superior qualities at the time. Now, even the, the paper with the best quality has its limitations, and those limitations are carried over into the pieces of, of art and, and uh, the pieces of writing that are made based on that painting, that, that paper. So here we can see that they're using the paper to its fullest potential by, by duplicating the amount of paper they're using to create one composition. So this is an example from, from the, the Song Dynasty, and it's depicting the, the goddess of the silkworm and in producing these beautiful silk tapestries. And this is a piece of art that's been preserved on this, this Juan paper. Now, this paper uh, is known throughout the world. It probably went along the Silk Road. Uh, it was probably exported all over the world at the time due to its qualities. And uh, because of that, people today still know Wenzhou paper. Now, um, there's, there's good reason for that. The paper is of superior quality. Here's another example from the Wenzhou Museum of this paper. One of the things that I really love about the paper is that it exudes 
uh, sorry, not the paper, but the, the piece of art, is that it exudes all the qualities that come together to create that piece of art, including the paper, the, the writing utensil, all of those things, the attitude of the artist, all of these things play a role in what, it, what comes out of the, of, of the composition in, in these circumstances, right? And <clears throat> that plays into a larger, larger cultural context of, of, um, of, of a whole place. When you have objects that are created locally and that are inspired by local thought, those things permeate the entire culture and it, becomes, it creates a richness and a quality that makes the place unique and special. A place that, that people want to come to because of that unique characteristic. And so that's why I think that Wenzhou paper is, is important and special and I think that's why pieces like this at the Wenzhou Museum are so important because they exude a local quality and that's important. So as, as, as trying to understand this local quality, I've visited as many paper facilities, local make, paper facility making uh, projects as possible. This is an example from, from Zeya. Uh, which is near a reservoir up, up in the mountains of Wenzhou. And uh, it was wonderful to watch this woman work. She had almost a choreographic nature about her, which was just wonderful to, to participate in and understand the quality and the ways that they make their paper. And the paper making for them is not just a job, but it's a way of life. It's, it's beautiful. And Zaya has a specific quality about it because of those, those things. Now, I've been pursuing um, this kind of research project with my students for the last several years as I've been teaching here in Wenzhou and I've tried to make this project as Wenzhou based as possible. Um, clearly, so I started the project using, using chopsticks and, uh, and that was because I was inspired by, I, I wanted to use local materials. Now chopsticks are kind of all across China but uh, when I came to, to Wenzhou I was thinking about, about those specifically. So, the project started as kind of a simple children's toy project, just making something fun for my children. And I did several attempts to try and make a, a children's toy, but none of them were very inspiring to me. Uh, finally, I decided that I needed to turn to nature. And so I looked for inspiration within chemistry. I'd like to invite my colleague uh, from the Department of Chemistry to talk a little bit about the carbon molecule and how uh, how important the carbon molecule is in, uh, in our daily lives and in everything that we, we do and see. Hello everyone, my name is Ye Lushi. I am an assistant professor of chemistry at Wenzhou King University. I am happy to be invited by Professor Rob Spencer Stembolik to join this exciting project to explore the miracles in natural things chemistry and architecture. You may hear two phrases, carbon-based life and silicon-based life. Life on Earth, including our human beings, is based on carbon. Silicon-based life is a gas of alien life and only exists in science fiction now. Carbon occurs naturally in great abundance on Earth Carbon's abundance and the unique diversity of compounds enable this element to serve as a common element of all known life. See the gray color in the DNA picture here and the cyan color in the protein picture here. They represent the carbon atoms and carbon atoms are the backbones of these critical life essential molecules life related things and almost everything in your daily life contain carbon such as petrol sugar pencil oil plastic bags diamonds papers soap and wood pure carbon can form various types of 3d structures let's zoom in to have a look in this slide the first crystal structure is diamond and it has the highest hardness. On the right side, the second one in comparison is the carbon atoms form layers of rings. You can see that it's not a crystal structure, it's layer by layer structure. This structure makes it very soft. 
the layers between can make it move very soft and slippery. So that's why when you use a pencil, that's a graphite in your pencil, that when you write it, it is so smooth, it's easy to use. And the third one, long stalate, is another type of crystal structure. So it's a crystal structure, structure so it also looks quite bright and shiny, very similar to diamond. The high symmetric bulky pore structure shown here was discovered decades ago, and NASA also observed it in the universe. With science development, more different shapes of carbon structure have been created, such as nanotubes. A single carbon atom can form up to four bonds with other atoms, like the joint show here as a carbon atom. Naturally, the carbon atom prefers to form the symmetric tetrahedral structure. Then each bond angle will be approximately 109.47 degree. If we continue to connect the other four joints in these four directions, it will look like a diamond structure. Just like the diamond, it could be pretty stable. Professor Stimblick developed the joint which can connect with eight sticks or bonds. This kind of structure in science we call it square antiprismatic and also exists in metal-based crystal structures. With these different joints binding by sticks, it can build a lot of different architecture models. Let me give this back to Professor Stimblick to tell how he created his art pieces inspired by nature. Thank you. Thank you. We really tried to consider the, the carbon molecule as we designed our node, designed our, our joint, this, this joint. And <clears throat> one of the things that we found was, was uh, an interesting idea was to duplicate the number of, of, um, of connections that the carbon joint, that the, 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 then the carbon, so that we ended up with, with eight joints instead of four joints. And that meant that we had a lot more degrees of freedom. It's like uh, Professor Yelu said, it's like a metallic joint, but it has the, the angles embedded in the carbon joint. And that's a kind of a unique characteristic of these, these joints as opposed to other joints. <clears throat> and so with that, we have the ability to, to um, do more things with it. Here we can see an example of some of the student sculptures that we've made. This is uh, adamantane, which is based on, which is the basis of the diamond. And some of my students used adamantane to, to create this simple sculpture here at a, at a workshop in Hainan recently. The quality here is semi-organic and it has this kind of beautiful asymmetrical balance that, uh, that nature often carries with it. <clears throat> when, doing, when working with these, with these node structures, these joint structures, we started by using a 3D printer to, to, to um, make the joints. And we started at the, the much smaller scale. We started with, with, the, uh, with the chopstick scale. Here you can see one of our early models and one of the models that, uh, that the children might play with as well. And um, using the 3D printer allowed us to make forms and prototype quickly, which was an important process because we went through many different iterations of the node, optimizing it for strength and, and for uh, ease of use. And like I said early in the presentation, I wanted to use local, local materials. And the reason why that's important to me is, like I said, uh, these local materials embed themselves in the identity of the objects and exude themselves in the attitudes that we, that we understand as, a, as a, being a, a, cr a quintessential part of, what we're, of who we are. And so chopsticks became an important part of what we were doing. We started designing these nodes and, and building, um, building pieces. Uh, we used these extender pieces and they ended up being too fragile and ex using way too much material, which uh, is a testament to the, the utilitarian and efficiency of, of the node, the, the joint, the, car the carbon-based 
joint that we've been using. So here you can see uh, working with these to create some interesting forms and geometries with my students. We've had quite a, quite a bit of fun making these different projects. Uh, here are some kind of design ideas. This one could be used uh, for uh, refugee populations for water gathering and heating with integrated solar panels and, and water catchment basins uh, in <coughs> included. Again, going back to, to the diamond being so efficient, we use the diamond pattern to make large towers, three, four meters tall, using just chopsticks and plastic, and arches, many different, different pr projects. And then we decided to scale up a little bit. We felt like we'd understood the, the joint, the node, and we wanted to try and scale up. So here you can see these mid-scale models that, that we've made, some of them um, <coughs> uh, taller and some of them more, more broad. But they're using this mid-scale um, uh, materials. So we have, we have fiberglass and we have a, a, a similar node as we've been using before. <clears throat> After having success at this mid-scale, we again decided that we wanted to scale up. And so we, we moved to wooden dowels that were 1.2 uh, meters long. And so then um, one of the early installations that we did with these wooden, wooden, uh, wooden struts was inspired by the sun tunnels at, um, by Nancy Holt in the western United States. And so we put together this carbon alignment uh, sculpture installation that was done uh, a, a year or two ago. And we, we had a lot of fun with that one. It was inspired again by Nancy Holt, and then we, we had an opportunity to kind of uh, engage in the community there. After, after we had this commission, we then moved on and had other opportunities to, to build projects. So this was the next project, which was um, which was going to be in San Francisco Bay Area. And so in preparation for this, for this exhibition that we were invited to participate in, we started building models. And so here's some of the early models that we made kind of in preparation for this, this installation. We, we decided that we wanted to start cladding the, the sculpture. And so we moved away from just having the framework and started trying to create enclosure and trying to understand spaces inside versus spaces outside. And so we, we did some early tests. Here's myself with, with my students here in Wenzhou working to, to make this prototype sculpture. In this prototype, our joints ended up not being strong enough. So we ended up needing to innovate and use stronger materials for the 3D printing of our, of our nodes. Um, but we did find that we, we, we had success with this fabric. <clears throat> so this was the prototype that we made in Wenzhou before before taking it to the United States. So here we have the final model that we made just before getting on the airplane. <clears throat> here you can see it again. One of the things that I think is important about, this, about the whole uh, experience is that we want to try and use the molecular logics embedded within the, the joint that is derived from the carbon molecule but then we want to try to create an asymmetrical balance that um, allows, the, allows the, the, the project, whatever, whatever we're creating, to have a life of its own outside of the, the heavy-handed geometric um, inevitabilities that come with something like, like a carbon molecular structure. So here we are building it here in San Francisco. <clears throat> And this is what it ended up, ended up looking like. We, we had quite a, f a fun time at, at Verge 19 and where we were able to, to install this sculpture. We call it Artemis Science Fair because it looks a little bit scientific, a little bit um, maybe less aesthetic and, and more technical in some way. But we had a good time in putting it together and we learned a lot of things uh, in, in putting it together. While we were in California, we uh, decided that we needed to innovate with the, with the node, with the joint, uh, again. <clears throat> so part of that was, was thinking about how to make the joint using flat material, uh, decreasing the cost and increasing the, the, the amount of nodes we could make to increase the, the size and the scale of the, of the sculptures. 
So we decided to, to use wood as an early prototype with this and, and laser cut the wood to create this, these joints. And uh, we, we then tested other materials to see their strength and the ability of the joint to be structural. We ended on, on metal and, <coughs> and used aluminum and uh, plate steel to make these nodes. And then we had the opportunity to test them. And we had a lot of fun testing them um, and found that they were interesting and, and fun uh, and, and less expensive potentially, but the, the challenges were, were still there. So we went back to the drawing board again and we ended up with, uh, with the node we currently use, which is, which is this one. It's a little bit more symmetrical, a little bit less uh, tribrachidium, which is a, a chemistry term talking about the, the symmetric, symmetricality of the object. Um, but I think that this node has a lot of, a lot of potential to it and we've, we found a lot of success using it. <clears throat> now, the project is, is interesting by itself, but we, we're interested in taking it further. We'd really like to incorporate um, dynamics into the systems. And uh, so we're thinking about making these things move in some way. And we can use, um, we can use computation or computers to help us to, to organize that. A previous research project that I worked on at uh, the City University of New York was dealing with tensegrity. And we presented our work at MIT and had a lot of success and a fun time doing it. And tensegrity is an interesting um, idea because it's very diff difficult to control, but it has a lot of efficiency to it. And if we can control the tensegrity, um, we have inherent opportunities for innovation, I, I believe. So here you can see some of my optimization work that I did. Um, some of my optimization work that I did to try and make sure that we could optimize these tensegrity structures to be most efficient. And we can see other models that we, that we were using with a, with a multi-fitness solver to kind of really fine-tune these, these tensegrity structures. This is uh, one example of a tensegrity model using the carbon molecular structure, the, the carbon natural nodes, um, where, we're, where we're creating a large amount of, of, uh, of cover with a, minimal car uh, with a minimal column. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential with tensegrity and the carbon molecular structure, the, the carbon natural node. One of our inspirations is the Super Ball made by NASA. It's a walking tensegrity ball. And I'm not so interested in making a walking robot as an architect, but what I am interested in is, um, is using tensegrity to, to help us to make responsive spaces, spaces that respond to nature. So here you can see an early test of ours where we're using a tension sensor to help us understand the, the tension loads on these different joints. And if we can incorporate this dynamics and this, this sensor system into um, one of these installations, we can really create some interesting dynamics. So can you imagine this, this sculpture slightly adjusting to follow the sun to maximize solar angle for solar panels or, uh, or minimize solar exposure for those who are inside? That's where we'd really like to take this project. Now, <clears throat> We've been commissioned locally to put, it, put together a sculpture and one of the opportunities we felt like we had was to, to try to embed local culture into our process of making. So that was one of the reasons why we went to Zaya to, to understand their paper making process and to, to get to know the way that they make their paper using you know, these screens to, to pull the pulp out of the water and then to lay it on a stack. And then you can see that they have these beads down here to separate the paper into different size, to size the size, the correct sizes, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> the thing that's most important to me is that these ways of making embed themselves in the sculptures that come out. Just like the poets and the painters of the past 
these sculptures are inherently made better by the, by the paper, that, by the materials that make them. We were commissioned to put together this installation here in Wenzhou, and we really wanted to make it a Wenzhou specific sculpture, something that really exuded Wenzhou culture and had a kind of a, a lineage or a connection to the people and the place. So we wanted to use the Wenzhou paper as a part of that. Um, that's, why, that's why we visited Zaya to understand their paper making process. This is a, a beautiful artifact from Zaya. Uh, it was, I, I purchased it when I was there in Zaya from, from the woman who, who, who runs the paper making facilities there. And she's, like I said, it's a lifestyle for them. And that lifestyle is embedded in every single sheet of, of paper that comes out of, of that place. It's very important um, the way that, that um, the artifacts that we, we use on a daily basis <clears throat> inform our actions, our attitudes, the way we live, our culture. That's why we felt like it was so important that we used a local, a local material as a part of our sculpture here. <clears throat> we really wanted to embed Wenjo into the sculpture. So here we can see one of the prototypes of this sculpture. And here on, on the left you can see another one. The one on the right here is, is bigger. It's, it's actually twice the scale. We decided that was maybe a little bit too big, so we've scaled it back here. This one is using 1.2 meter long tubes for the long side and one meter long tubes for the short side. And you can see we're using this paper that, that um, originally comes from Wenzhou. The, the, the whole process of making this type of paper originated here in Wenzhou. Um, the Wenzhou paper, <clears throat> like I said before, is, is uh, world-renowned, used f since the Tang Dynasty. Uh, and uh, in Wenzhou, they had a special street just for trading paper, a special area, whole area dedicated to, to the trade and the, the commerce of, of paper. And uh, it's had a huge impact, impact on, on the world. You can think about, all of, again, all of those all of those, uh, those prints, those woodcut prints, like the ones here in the Wenzhou Museum. Or you can think about um, those beautiful paintings. All these things that, throughout history that have used this exact same paper process. And uh, with, with these sculptures, really, really trying to connect back to Wenzhou by using the, the local papers. I believe that I mentioned the vernacular in the beginning, this idea of a local, local understanding of material. And uh, <clears throat> you may not think of these sculptures as vernacular, they're definitely contemporary, but they also have some aspects of vernacular built into them, just, just inherently by, by the type of material we're using. Some of our earlier sculptures were using a more synthetic fabric that can be found almost anywhere. It doesn't really have an origin. It's, it's a, a little bit, it's a little bit uh, manufactured, if you will. But um, being able to connect back to Wenjo and use, use a product or use something that, that's inherently embedded in, in the identity of this place was very important as we tried to develop uh, this sculpture and, and, try, and we're trying to use the paper as an integral part of, of uh, the process of making. If we were to use a different material, then this, this piece would look completely different. It's because of this material and, the way that, and its properties that makes this, this sculpture the way that it is. <clears throat> uh, again, the Wenzhou Museum helps us to understand uh, all about Wenzhou. And that's why they put these talks together, so that we can understand Wenjo in relationship to the rest of the world. And so I think that my, these sculptures, this Carbon Natural Project, is a really indicative uh, example of, of, the, of the, the whole talk series, where we're bringing inspiration from different places and, and bringing them together to create something new, interesting, 
and special. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, I look forward to, to having you see these carbon natural sculptures around. Thanks.